detect. One clear pattern is here. Uh, the mountain states are actually where you often find the highest levels of life satisfaction. You also see a little bit in terms of the coast there. And then you see a little bit of a lighter band here in terms of the rust belt. Uh, those places tend to be less happy there. But there are happy places and there are less happy places throughout the United States as well. Now one of the first things we wanted to do is to know whether or not these measures of life satisfaction are telling us something important about those regions. And so one of the ways we do this, we think in terms of validity and we think in terms of uh, are these actually mapping on to the things that theoretically we would expect to predict high quality of life and do, uh, uh, can we represent these in terms of the means of life satisfaction? And so what we did is looked at a variety of characteristics that we would think, but we don't really know, what, uh, would uh, correlate with the life satisfaction of the region. And so one of the things you might expect to matter is the income of the region, and it turns out that there are a lot of economic variables that do seem to matter for subjective well-being. So for instance, median income is one of the strongest predictors, so the higher income counties have higher life satisfaction. Uh, counties with lower <coughs> poverty, the lower levels of poverty have higher levels of life satisfaction. And then also a lot of things that correlated the uh, individual level like unemployment also correlated this aggregate level. So places with lower levels of unemployment do tend to be happier. Uh, a couple other things. Uh, and then things like income inequality we can look at too also matter at the lower level. Uh, one of the other things I think that's interesting when we start looking at the regional level is that some predictors do jump out that we typically ignore at the individual level. And I think that the strongest example of this is education level. So I think that one of the stories has been that education doesn't really make that much difference for subjective well-being at the individual level. Um, and we know that this doesn't necessarily tell us what's happening at the regional level. And it turns out that actually this is one of the, consistently one of the strongest predictors we find. That those places that have high education levels are happier than those places with uh, lower average education. So here, percentage high school degree, percentage college degree uh, are pretty strong predictors of the average level of satisfaction. Other things like what the percentage of people in uh, professional occupations also seem to matter. Uh, these uh, have less of an impact on life satisfaction. Um, so those types of characteristics seem to play a role in how uh, satisfied the region is. Other things like marital status, we know at an individual level it matters. Uh, to some extent it does. Oh, and actually I wanted to point out that this is not just an effect of income. So these uh, effect sizes remain about the same as the control for the income of the place. So it's not just the rich places are more educated and then that leads to higher life satisfaction. Um, these effects hold even more for that. Here we also see marital status plays some role. There's also a widowed effect, which also uh, stays or even controlling for age. Um, so there's something about that. Um, but one of the other things that we've been looking at that is kind of interesting has to do with the health of the region. And so it turns out that places that are happier are also uh, have better health than places that are less happy. So there's an indicator of physical health that the CDC collects, which reverse scores or higher scores mean lower physical health. It correlates uh, moderately with uh, life satisfaction. But then when we look at a lot of objective indicators like the obesity of the re obesity rates of the region, percentage of people with a disability, uh, mortality rates even at a regional level are correlated pretty strongly with the life satisfaction of these regions, including death from heart disease. Uh, if you look at some of the papers we've looked at this, it actually does vary by the condition. And so in some of the things that we would think would be more related to stress, like heart disease, are ones that correlate more strongly with the life satisfaction of the region. One interesting one is suicide, which in some ways we might think of as another indicator of quality of life, but that actually doesn't correlate that strongly. Um, there's some interesting ideas about why that might be, which perhaps we can talk about after we talk. Now, the, the, the second part of the talk that I wanted to focus on is going beyond these uh, characteristics that are associated with well-being. We want, one of the things we were wondering about is what happens, uh, do people recognize these differences and are these differences meaningful? So I think one of the things that if I were to show you the distribution of scores on life satisfaction, you might be surprised about is how small the variability is in terms of how the average score of the happiness, of the happiest counties versus the, the least happy. And so one of the things that we're concerned about, we would be concerned about is whether those differences are at all meaningful. Um, so we know that they correlate with some meaningful things, but it isn't the case that those happiest places are much, are much different than the least happy places. And so one of the things that we thought might be useful to look at is other indicators that these places are doing well. And the thing that we want to look specifically at had to do with population growth. Uh, and we really put this back to a paper by uh, Shkada and Kahneman, who argued that actually there were focusing illusions going on, and that everybody who lives in Illinois, for instance, thinks that people are happier in California because of great weather and these sorts of things. Everyone in California thinks they would be miserable in Illinois because of the horrible weather and the snow and these sorts of things. But if we actually survey people in these different places, there would be no differences in life satisfaction because there would be other factors that they're not paying attention to that balance out the life satisfaction. 
And therefore, actually, people would make mistakes if they judged, if they decided to move to California um, because of their beliefs about how happy they would be. Um, the problem with that study was that it was based on undergraduates in California and undergraduates in Illinois and their perceptions of what other people were like. So it's really difficult to tell from those studies what actually is the difference between the happiness of people in California and Illinois. And so we phrased this, framed this question differently and asked, when people move, do they tend to move to happier places? So another way to think about this is whether or not regional differences in life satisfaction predict population growth. Now again, this question I think is interesting for a couple of different reasons. One is that it's a test of the validity of this measure of, life, uh, of quality of life. Uh, so it does this one indicator of how good a region is, subjective ratings of life satisfaction, correlate with a more behavioral measure of how good a place is, whether people are deciding to move there and stay there. Um, but in addition to this, we can start to think, and our study does not actually address this question that carefully, but uh, we can start to think about what it is that is leading to this association. Are people moving to places that have characteristics that cause happiness? Uh, is there something about the growth of the region that once it starts growing, it, it seems really thriving and energetic and actually causes happiness? We can't answer those questions with our data, but I think the basic issue of question of whether or not there is an association is an important one. So our goal here in this part of the study then is to predict population growth from 2000 to 2010 from regional levels of life satisfaction. Again, we use the census data um, to do that and looked at these mean levels of satisfaction. So here's our initial, uh, the initial plot from this. And what we have on the uh, x-axis is life satisfaction. So again, this is a zero to four scale. And so what you see is that those differences in the mean are actually not that large. What I have here is uh, you know, 3.3, 3.4, 3.5. On uh, uh, the y-axis, we have the percentage of growth from 2000 to 2010. The size of the, uh, the point reflects the size of the county that we're assessing. So I think LA right down there. Um, so what you can see is that there's a very clear association, and a really strong association, actually, between the life satisfaction, average life satisfaction of the county and the extent to which it grew uh, over time. And so if you actually look at the average growth rate of these counties here who are pretty high in life satisfaction compared to those that are low in satisfaction, you see very consistently low levels of growth among those low level satisfac life satisfaction areas. And you show much higher, the more varied growth among those with high life satisfaction. Now one concern about this is that population growth results from lots of different things. It regards from people moving into, this, uh, into that uh, county, moves, it results from people dying, it results from birth rates, it results from all these different factors. So we can actually use the census data to try to separate out some of these things to see whether it is actually the case that people are moving to these uh, different uh, regions. And so the first thing we looked at is actually look at different indicators. One, again, is death rates. Now, based on those correlations I showed you, the mortality rates are correlated with life satisfaction. This should not be surprising that those places that are happier have lower death rates. So uh, that could potentially contribute to the differences in population growth over time. So those happy places actually have fewer people dying. Um, Birth rates don't seem to be really associated with the life satisfaction, so the happier places are not growing more because they're having more kids there. Um, so that doesn't seem to be the case. Uh, and <clears throat> so what we really want to isolate out is life satisfaction and its links with, uh, in this case, domestic migration. I'm not going to show you international migration, but the patterns there are relatively similar to what we find. I, I actually, uh, there aren't really many patterns there. Um, there's not much of an association there. But what we find here is that when we look at domestic migration and life satisfaction, again, we see a relatively strong association there, that those places that have the highest life satisfaction are the ones that are growing the fastest. And now we see more of a linear effect over, uh, in, in terms of this association. So it does look like when we isolate that particular component of where, whether people are moving into these counties uh, from 2000 to 2010, it seems as those places, as though those places that have the highest uh, life satisfaction have the highest growth. So what we know from uh, this type of research is that these counties do vary in self-reported life satisfaction. That's really clear. We can demonstrate that. We can assess these means, and they're reliable. The question that we're trying to address is whether that variability correlates with anything meaningful. And so what we can show is that they do correlate with objective health characteristics, the health of the region, the education of the region, the income of the region. All of those things seem to be associated with the life satisfaction that people report in those regions. But in addition, the big new contribution of this is to show that one important behavioral criterion, which we use to judge whether it is a good city, so I mean, uh, mayors are evaluated based on whether you know, they are uh, uh, population, high population growth or not, this is an indicator of the success of the region, 
that this behavioral criterion of migration can be predicted from regional differences in life satisfaction. Now again, from this correlation alone, we don't necessarily know whether this is due to people picking happy places and moving to those happy places. It seems pretty unlikely at this point because before this point, we didn't have data on uh, the light of happiest places, so it's not like that they have this list and they're choosing the ones that are the happiest to have something like that, but uh, it's unlikely to guide this. It may be that they know the characteristics that are important for the life satisfaction and they move to the places that have those, the places that have uh, better schools and the places that have lower levels of unemployment. Um, or, as I said before, it could be due to the fact that those places that are growing for whatever reason and this creates some sort of enthusiasm and excitement, and then that leads to a feeling, uh, feelings of positivity and high life satisfaction. So I think the future work looking at the time trends of these sorts of things might be able to uh, examine those questions in more detail.